uh, good morning uh, i should say good morning to the two sum because there are only two people in the audience we hope it will get better with time uh, welcome to our uh, update program on end of thalmitis post operative end of thalmitis uh, we have four speakers but there will be a lot of overlap in the subject matter and you will see uh, the same things repeated multiple times only to emphasize the importance of that particular point in question uh, i have great pleasure in uh, introducing dr guru prasad who heads the department of uh, vitreo retina at the famous mm joshi eye hospital in hubli he is a vitreo retinal surgeon with uh, probably the most experience in our state of karnataka in matters related to vitreo retina he will be talking to us about sniffing the enemy you know trying to diagnose post operative end of thalmitis at a very early stage as we all know time is vision in matters of end of thalmitis and the quickly we how quickly we diagnose also determines how effectively the end result can be addressed i request dr guru prasad to please deliver his talk on sniffing the enemy in post operative end of thalmitis good morning thank you very much dr kumar for having me in sic uh, so sniffing the enemy early diagnosis of post operative end of thalmitis is what i'm going to speak in the next 5 minutes and after that the format is that we speak for 5 minutes or bit more and then the rest of the time is taken up for discussion so why should we sniff because we have seen that there are fulminant types of end of thalmitis that can destroy vision in a single day next point one day the eye i can go from post operative vision of 6 by 6 to in pl negative the less acute type can go unnoticed by the patient because something that is smoldering inside without any congestion or symptoms can be ignored by the patient and by the time the patient reaches the the uh, situation is disastrous every hour counts time is vision is just what uh, dr kumar said which is so apt and uh, so we should know how to sniff uh, we should know how to differentiate between tars and endophthalmitis and this is the long list uh, put up there of uh, the differentiating features between endophthalmitis and infective endophthalmitis and tars and probably the top 3 timing of occurrence pain uh, as a symptom and lid edema as a sign are the three most important differentiating features besides congestion corneal edema iris pupil and intraocular pressure which is not so important as the first three whom to sniff uh, well we should know that we should uh, have a high index of suspicion in patients where uh, they have had a, a pcr and even full surgery a pcr or a retained lens material long duration versus mdcs something which i learned recently <laughs> minimal duration cataract surgery which is totally wrong according to me Uh, iris handling when there has been too much of that improper wound construction and suturing vitreous in the wound exposure of sutured knot iris prolapse incarceration of the iris use of iris hooks or pupil expanders uveitic eyes uh, a reaction disproportionate to the surgical trauma a diabetic patient an immunocompromised patient and for that matter every post cataract patient so the time to sniff is time to diagnose or look for end of thalmitis is probably day 2 the day after the surgery day 7 a week after the surgery and 30 days after the surgery in a normal patient but when it comes to these risk factors one has to be have a different protocol of regimen altogether parameters for quantifying the signs by either clinical examination or by actually documenting or photographing these signs the cornea can show different uh, um, severity uh, levels of uh, edema at uh, with varying severity infiltration of the wound site as you can see here anti chamber can show hypopion and cells like this capsular back can have exudates vitreous can have cells and exudates b scan can show with echoes exudates or lens droppings for that matter when there is a pcr and of course retinochoroidal thickening and posterior subtenance fluid in a case of severe endophthalmitis going on for panophthalmitis 
So protocol in a case of increased reaction, whenever we have an increased reaction to uh, the cataract surgery, we have to suspect infective endothermitis unless proved otherwise. Intensify antibiotic steroid drops hourly or even half hourly. Decompress the eye twice a day. Uh, this decompression is what I'm going to show you in the next slide. If there's no response in 12 hours, then you give intravitreal antibiotics. If there's no response in the next 12 hours, probably you will go for vitrectomy. So this is what I mean by decompression done on the slit clamp under topical anesthesia. Identify the side port of the cataract surgery and just press on the scleral lip. So and then you let out the aqueous humor from the antechamber, which releases the fluid from the antechamber, debulks the turbid aqueous, brings in fresh aqueous, clears the cornea and the antechamber and allows fundus examination with which you can make a better assessment of what is there behind the lens. So post-operative follow-up in a PCR, when there is a PCR for example, you have to do it the same evening. It is different from a routine cataract surgery. I would like to see the patient every few hours. If I have a PCR, I will call the patient the same evening, again next day, again on the third day and so on and on. I mean, I would like to see the patient as frequently as is convenient to the patient. But I have developed a uh, method by which I teach the patient self-assessment of vision every day. The patient himself will assess his vision. It is not the lid edema, congestion or pain that the patient will be worried, should be worried about. I tell this patient to, to I tell this to every patient when I'm discharging. You should not worry if there is lid edema, congestion or pain. But if there is loss of vision, then only you should worry. And that is the time when you should rush back to the hospital for uh, necessary prompt action. So this is a chart which I uh, try to sort of uh, give to a patient on a A4 size uh, paper in the in printout. Or I could even, I would even uh, tell him to look at the photographs of his family on the wall of the of his room or the calendar or something like that from a fixed distance. And this is something that can diagnose endothermitis early. So save the eye from being lost to endothermitis by teaching the patients the safe exercise. This is one message I would like to give here. The uh, self-assessment of vision every day is something which I follow for every patient of cataract or any post-operative case. So ocular sampling is another thing, the anterior chamber tap and the vitreous biopsy that we have to uh, do and give intravitreal antibiotics or do di di diagnostic or therapeutic vitrectomy as the case may warrant, especially when the vision and the glow are rapidly deteriorating. So other uh, types of uh, endothermitis, the delayed endothermitis is something which we have to keep in mind. They come usually two to three weeks after the surgery Propionibacterium acne is one organism which can be very, very uh, misleading. It can just appear as a flare-up of the inflammatory reaction that occurs uh, immediate post-op and it can come back a little later. And this is something that one should be familiar with. It usually causes the breadcrumb-like appearance on the posterior capsule or within the capsular bag. Fungal endothermitis, especially the candida, can also be similar to the uh, P acne endothermitis in terms of the time of onset, but varies in, in, in that it, the cotton ball appearance is seen both in the antechamber and in the vitreous cavity. And bleb related endothermitis can, can occur anywhere between um, three weeks to 30 years after, cater, after the glaucoma surgery or a combined surgery. So one should be familiar with all these different types of uh, endothermitis, the bacterial endothermitis, fungal endothermitis, endogenous endothermitis and so on. A systemic uh, assessment I think is very appropriate to mention here because it is, is that is one thing which probably will complete the talk. Look for signs of septicemia, fever, elevated ESR, blood culture in cases of endogenous endothermitis, blood tests like the uh, uh, routine hemogram, renal and liver function test to look for drug toxicity which can uh, manifest as endothermitis and search for the focus of infection in endogenous endothermitis. So in summary, I would like to say that you have sh you should have a high index of suspicion, especially in high risk cases, which I mentioned. Always err on the side of infection, act swiftly, Ex exercise, save, 
save is an exercise and every inflammation is infection unless proved otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Guru Prasad. The excellent learning points, particularly decompressing the anterior chamber and the new concept of save, which would save the eye and save the ophthalmologist's reputation as well. If you, if there are any questions addressed to the topic that Dr. Guru Prasad covered, we can discuss them because we only have few people in the audience. Would any one of them have any questions or clarifications to seek on the topic that we just discussed, sniffing the enemy? If there are none, then we'll go ahead with the next topic. Uh, I should have introduced uh, my faculty to begin with. Uh, we don't have Dr. Srinivas Joshi with us today because he's uh, busy with other things. Uh, Dr. Guru Prasad was the person who just spoke to you. We have Dr. Apurva, his illustrious daughter, who will be speaking on don'ts in endophthalmitis subsequent to my talk and Dr. Mahesh Gopalakrishnan, a renowned vitreoretinal surgeon at Cochin in Giridhar Sai Institute. He will be addressing the very important topic of medical legal implications, how to mitigate and how to avoid in the first place. So, now Dr. Guru Prasad uh, mentioned in the last slide that every suspicious post-operative reaction should be assumed to be infectious until otherwise proved, which is also what I'm trying to emphasize, if you hear hoof beats, you will be commonly right if you think that it is horses and not think that it is zebras, although zebras also can produce the same sound. So the more commoner diagnosis you make in the case of endophthalmitis, you should err on the side of infection and not TAS. You should look for what is there in the eye rather than what is not there. Most of us try to console ourselves by saying the patient is not complaining of pain, there is no lead edema. Now these are all very, very soft signs. If the patient has impaired vision and there is increased reaction in the anterior chamber plus minus hypopion, it is infective and all measures to deal with that in that direction should be taken. So in that regard, I would just like to uh, draw your attention to Murphy's laws, which in essence means that if a certain thing can go wrong, then it will go wrong. So you must be prepared. If you operate, there is a possibility that something may go wrong. So be alive and alert to that possibility. The other thing that I would like to draw your attention to is what has been referred to as the Kubler-Ross grief cycle. When we are confronted with a difficult situation in life, as in a patient who develops an increased reaction, the first reaction will usually be denial. We try to say, I've done a good surgery. It's unlikely that this patient has endophthalmitis. There's no way that this patient could have developed endophthalmitis. And then there is a little anger at some of our OT staff maybe did you do something wrong? Then you try to bargain with the situation, then you get into depression and finally you accept. Now this should be completely reversed. Acceptance should come in straight away in whenever there is a situation of an endophthalmitis. So apart from uh, the rigorous attention to asepsis at all stages of the continuum of the operative procedure, starting from cleaning, sterilization, preoperative preparation of the patient, intra and postoperative aspects, we must be very, very cautious about the preoperative careful assessment. All of us are so keen on knowing only one thing, how well the pupil dilates before cataract operation. But there are a host of other things that we should be looking at and not overlook. Obvious signs in the lids such as these are a no-brainer really. But if you have patients who present with this subtle foamy discharge at the lid margins here, it indicates a low-grade low infection in the eyelids. Frank frothy discharge at the lid margins are a big no-no for any cataract surgery. Look at this patient who had slight fullness of the lid on the temporal aspect, but if you avert the lid and see, you see these two pus points and in fact a streak of mucopurulent discharges there as well. So if, and the other set of photographs at the bottom, I was trying to draw your attention to the fact that if we examine these patients on slit lamp under high magnification, we may just be looking at this uh, cornea, the cataract and the pupil, and we may not be the, the looking at the lids itself. Whereas if you 
examine with a little lower magnification an obvious audiolum that this patient has and the undulations along the lid margin. These things can be completely missed if you straight away go to a high mag and don't look at the adnexa beforehand. Also, patients who have undergone previous buckles may have granulomas in the fornices, exposed buckles or sutures, and these things may be overlooked if a proper history is not taken and all our attention is directed only towards the cataract. So, draping is very, very important. It should be, you know, you should ensure that all the eyelashes are properly tucked underneath the um, drape, then three minutes contact with povidone iodine. There should be no compromise on this as well. I, what I also do is a thorough conjunctival irrigation, a pre-entry to, to try and physically drain away any pathogens that may be there. And then, of course, trying to keep the AC well-formed at conclusion. If the AC is not well-formed, it is thought that there's a suction effect into the AC and that draws bacteria into the eye at the end of surgery. So uh, keeping a well-formed AC with proper hydration of the wounds at the end is an important one of the do's in prevention of endophthalmitis. Uh, all of us marvel at our surgical skills and completely uh, delegate the post-operative care to the assistants in our hospitals or many times don't even bother about this. We had this patient who came in with uh, hypopion on the third post-operative day and this, was, this, this photo has not been taken just for the purposes of presentation here. All the hairs there were all getting into the conjunctival sac and this was, the, this was how it was. Now, what we have started doing is advising patients to wear, particularly women, to wear this kind of a hair band there so that you know, the hairs of the scalp don't get into the conjunctival sac and cause infections. The other point which I was trying to highlight is examining the patients in the lying down position is, is a big no-no post-operatively. Many times in hospitals when there are multiple surgeries done, patients are examined with a torch light in the lying down position, position and if the subconch has been given, then the hypopion which is actually there may be layered out like this in a concave manner and the overlying conjunctiva with a bleb there may be obscuring this hypopion. So we have to examine these patients in the sitting down posture and on the slit lamp. The other situation where early hypopion may be missed is when the patient has a prominent arcus. So those are some situations where, you know, these probably would, be, would have been relevant to Dr. Uh, Guru Prasad sniffing the enemy early never examine in the recumbent posture, always examine in the erect posture and on the slit lamp. Be aware of an overhanging inferior conjunctival bleb related to a subconch given or arcus if the patient has one. The same patient with appropriate uh, intravitreal uh, injection. I was referring to this kind of a inferior chemosis of the conjunctiva. We will not go into this, which is, you will see this chart probably uh, even in Dr. Uh, Apurva's lecture. This, these are uh, clues to tell you whether this patient has TAS or endophthalmitis. But broadly speaking, if there is a severe reaction on the first post-operative day without any corneal infiltrate and the hypopion is not yellow but white with a fibrinous reaction in the anterior chamber, that patient most probably has TAS. And if the pupil dilates very well to your measures at dilating, that is, the pupil dilating freely well, freely well is another important clue to suggest that probably we are dealing with TAS. Now, coming to the management itself, we are, it has been very well emphasized by Dr. Guru Prasad. Uh, what I would like to highlight is uh, one should not sit back and say now the the case has been has has gone into the domain of the vitreoretinal surgeon and we can't do anything. The operating surgeon should look for perpetuating factors such as a wound leak or if there is a side port which is too large and there is any track from there, suture abscesses. So these things can be addressed immediately along with intravitreal injections, which is not the domain of the vitreoretinal surgeon. It should become the domain of the treating other the surgeon who operated on the patient first. We will discuss that a little later. These are some pictorial diagrams about how to take the anterior chamber and the vitreous tap. You raise a bleb of a local anesthetic as shown here and then uh, methods at uh, vitreous aspiration, uh, either using a vitreous cutter, which is ideal, or you can passively uh, try and uh, get vitreous out with the plunger removed. If the vitreous happens to be liquefied, you'll get some aspirate in such cases. So these are some of the things that I was alluding to. Uh, any provocative uh, serial test that shows a wound leak, track from the side ports, etc. And these are pictures showing that all is not lost in endophthalmitis. If you diagnose early and act promptly, 
endophthalmitis response many cases respond very well to intravitreal therapy which is really the first aid and the other important thing is when diluting the samples for intravitreal injections you must be appropriately gloved you should not take it easy because as you can see from the picture here we will be touching the plunger and if we do it bare hand then a contaminated hand can contaminate this plunger itself which will again be going into the barrel of the syringe so we must use aseptic techniques in preparation of the injection and always refer to the charts in dilution the faintest ink is better than the sharpest memory they say so always refer to the charts before you make the dilutions so these are some pictures to show uh, endophthalmitis that responded well to intravitreal um, sorry vitrectomy techniques so prevention as far as tas is concerned it's important to follow standard operating procedures in the in the whole gamut of the operation uh, theater area regular health education of all paramedics and recalibrating the system on a regular basis is important as far as endophthalmitis is concerned an obsessive compulsive attention to asepsis and uh, you, one should be uh, almost uh, you know uh, as i say obsessively compulsively um, attentive to any breach in asepsis that may occur and uh, the more we sweat during peace that is the more we sweat during our normal days the less we may bleed whenever there is a situation of an endophthalmitis uh, this is the uh, flow chart to show about how we should really go about uh, handling patients with endophthalmitis uh, initially uh, according to the evs study vitrectomy was useful only in a subset of cases but nowadays uh, with improved instrumentation and better antibiotics available the paradigm shift in the management has taken place and we now tend to operate early the other video which i wanted to show was um, how to take the samples from the anterior chamber see many times these patients will have thick fibrinous uh, purulent material in the anterior chamber which will preclude a view of the fundus in case we are taking these patients up for vitrectomy so removing this provides material improves visualization and it also prevents zippering of the angle and recalcitrant post operative secondary glaucoma so you can see that it's really very thick and you you will see that the iris looks completely a different color and hue once you remove all this and you can see how much of this is there in the periphery as well of course you must be very careful not to strip off the desmets membrane in these patients because the cornea will also be edematous so you should uh, be extremely careful in what you are doing and not pull something uh, you know randomly this is an unedited video it is just showing how much of pus is there in the anterior uh, chamber fibrinous membrane in some it may be very obvious in some others it may be a thin diaphanous membrane almost seems as if it's multi layered so once we clear this then the subsequent steps of vitrectomy in these patients become becomes a lot easier again as uh, more videos to show the same and then we go ahead and uh, do the vitrectomy which again is a difficult uh, procedure in many patients because of poor visibility etc which that is not the subject matter of discussion really and the other thing which i wanted to highlight is this you drape the patients well you put betadine and then irrigate the conjunctival sac and after appropriate dilution if anterior segment surgeons are scared you can use the hub of this 1 cc disposable syringe itself as a marker ideally you should have a marker but this is a good enough rule of thumb to use you can place one edge at the limbus and then the distal end will be where you enter the eye with a 30 gauge needle you should always use a 30 gauge needle because that is in fact in countries abroad they are using a smaller gauge needle than that but we have access to only the 30 gauge needle so that's we, we must be using that and not a 26 gauge needle because there will be a lot of reflux with the larger bore needle 
after injecting you you go perpendicular to the scleral surface towards the midvitreous cavity inject very gently to avoid any jet stream effects and with the bevel facing the iol and then close with a cotton tipped applicator so as to prevent reflux so those are some of the do's in endophthalmitis uh, i will now request dr apurva to please present her talk on don'ts uh, admittedly there will be a lot of overlap because do's and don'ts so but then the points that will be uh, worth emphasizing and learning will be highlighted Thank you, Kumar sir, for this opportunity to speak in this uh, IC about endophthalmitis. Like uh, we said before, can we have the slide? Like we said before, there is going to be a lot of overlap. So nowadays, it's very fashionable to say, "Don't not do this" or "Don't not do that." Uh, so that becomes a do only. So uh, either way, it is okay to have overlap and reiterate the same things. because it, you can never over emphasize anything when it comes to endophthalmitis so don'ts uh, can be divided into don'ts that help in prevention don'ts that help in diagnosis and don'ts when it comes to management so these points also kumar sir was uh, kind enough to share with me and add to my presentation so don'ts that help in prevention we should not be lackadaisical in some situations and these are when the patient has high risk of endophthalmitis high risk patient means high risk eyes so who are the high risk patients uh, diabetics especially those with a higher hba1c or those who have had an acute control of hba1c when the hba1c levels have been drastically reduced those patients on dialysis for chronic kidney disease due to uh, diabetes or any other cause and diabetic foot is a source potentially of uh, systemic uh, sepsis or septicemia uh, in patients with malignancy and those with uh, chemotherapy their colonic infections are very common and microemboli of uh, microorganisms into the blood stream are very common so these patients have a subacute sepsis and it is safe to assume that they are always in a uh, uh, in a state of subacute sepsis because of this so in such patients a blood culture urine and stool culture is uh, probably uh, indicated more often than not because that can uh, uncover some infections and we have to be on uh, guard for such patients even patients on chronic steroid therapy or immunosuppressants for collagen vascular disease or any other immune mediated diseases are high risk patients and um, some many times in uh, community in the community or camps we operate on patients who are homeless or destitute and have very very poor hygiene such patients are also high risk next we should not neglect post op instructions as very nicely pointed out by dr kumar uh, doc, uh, now when when we prescribe patients with uh, post op medication we usually say that topical steroids have to be used uh, in a tapering manner and initially it can be high as high as hourly or two hourly and the cycloplegic is what we instill uh, twice a day or maybe even once a day but when the patient comes for a follow up to our utter shock and surprise and dismay the patient is actually putting the cycloplegic once uh, every hour and the steroid uh, twice a day so in such cases uh, we uh, you know slap our uh, head and you know that's probably because of a miscommunication on part of us or when we delegate such uh, instructions to the uh, fellow or the resident and who in turn gives these instructions to the patient so maybe uh, we have to make sure that there is no miscommunication and uh, a detailed and comprehensive prescription has to be given it we have seen that it helps when we write the instructions or the dosage on the packaging of the drops 
coming to uh, don'ts and diagnosis so in the camp and outreach community programs uh, we do use a flashlight for screening patients who have to undergo surgery pre operatively unfortunately because of the hundreds of patients we sometimes tend to use a flashlight or torch for post operative examination here i have used this photograph just to show that there is a very uh, early hypopion here and it can be missed on torch examination or a flashlight examination especially if there is uh, an inferior bleb or a conjunctival bleb when we have injected a subconjunctival uh, antibiotic and steroid combination it can obscure the hypopion so when there is a chemosis on post op day it is always uh, preferable to look uh, underneath it for a hypopion and slit lamp is the way to go it has to be used always and always for every patient we have operated next is don't hope against hope that it is not end of cell mitis and delay action we have to keep the patient admitted and monitor every few hours and can discharge after 24 hours so if we tell the patient that there is a reaction that was unexpected post surgery the patient also uh, becomes a little alert uh, of course there's a way of uh, communicating things infection the word infection can alarm a patient so instead of that if we say something like there is some unexpected reaction and you would like to observe the patient will be uh, inclined to stay back and you can discharge them after 24 hours so hoping against hope that it is tas is not a good idea uh, we have seen the differences between tas and infective endophthalmitis in many many presentations but like i said to reiterate uh, tas is usually on the first post op day and there is no pain there is lid edema is uncommon congestion is minimal corneal edema is limbus to limbus the iris is uh, fixed and, and uh, the pupil is fixed and dilated the iop can be raised and the response to topical steroids is dramatic infective of the on the other hand is a little delayed maybe third post operative day to seventh depending on acute or sub acute onset of the endophthalmitis and the virulence and inoculum of the organisms pain may pre may be present but what is most important is the diminution of vision uh, congestion can be more than that seen in tas corneal edema is patchy uh, pupil can be variable in size iop is also variable and the response to steroids is only temporary coming to don'ts in treatment we should not delay injection just because we don't have access to gram stain culture and sensitivity we don't delay in giving an intravitreal empirically with uh, amikacin and moxifloxacin and this has been the uh, uh, antibiogram uh, susceptibility that is seen in this part of the world and even if tap and cultures are not possible it is always better to give an intravitreal empirically because if we do get a microbial diagnosis and we see that this uh, this i or this infection is susceptible to what we are already giving and the patient is doing well that is the end of treatment suppose in the microbial diagnosis the uh, the susceptibility is not there in fact the it shows the resistance to the antibiotics that we are using but the patient even then is doing well we don't recommend switching off the antibiotics to the ones that the organism is susceptible to so a clinically i doing well you, continuing the use of what is working is recommended and that will in fact uh, be the end of treatment despite uh, uh, non susceptibility on the antibiogram so another very important don't is to not over treat with analgesics so when a patient requires nsaids or any other pain medication for more than a day in a surgery like phacoemulsification emulsification which should not be painful uh, the, that means all is not well so pain can be masked uh, with use overuse of nsaids and that can be a false reassurance that pain is not there it can be a false lull that the patient can be in because uh, it doesn't alarm the patient to come back to the treating physician of course we should not ignore the dose or the method of preparation like kumar sir showed 
uh, he said a very nice sentence that the faintest ink is better than the brightest memory so we keep a chart of antibiotics and their preparation methods on the wall of our or of all our ors if there are more than one and uh, we know how to make uh, these uh, intravitreal preparations also there is something called an e kit that you can keep uh, which has all the requirements for treatment uh, or giving intravitreals the antibiotics the uh, the uh, um, diluting solutions the appropriate number of syringes for dilution the injecting uh, syringes a speculum even and the needles so last point is to not delay referral for sure if there is no response in 12 to 24 hours and the patients seem to be worsening with increase in hypopion congestion further drop of vision especially less than 1 by 60 if the glow disappears if there are vitreous echoes on ultrasound we refer immediately because in endophthalmitis like everybody before me has said timing of uh, definitive treatment that is vitrectomy is crucial Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Apurva, for that excellent talk. I acknowledge uh, the presence of my teacher and uh, professor of ophthalmology, Dr. Ashok Sharma, uh, during my residency days. Uh, sir, we missed you during the first two talks. Uh, I think we can have a little bit of a discussion because we still have ample time before the last talk from Dr. Mahesh, which will be also touching on an important aspect, which is how to prevent and mitigate uh, medical legal sequelae in endophthalmitis. Sir, can I, uh, can I ask one question? Please, sir, please. Uh, the last presentation, uh, it has been shown that HbA1c greater than 9% is a risk factor. HbA1c greater than 9% is a risk factor and uh, also dialysis, the predisposing factors. Uh, what I saw in my practice, patients undergoing dialysis, uh, they do very well uh, if the dialysis is properly weekly done, twice a week, uh, no, no uh, complications thereof. 15, 20 patients undergoing dialysis properly, no complications thereof. Whereas on the other side, uh, people having HB1C 7, 7.5%, they got uh, uh, endophthalmitis rarely though, rarely. But dialysis patients, if they are uh, doing well with the dialysis, continuing with the dialysis regularly, uh, they didn't show up any complication. Uh, post, I'm saying about the post-operative period of the cataract surgery. Yeah, uh, that is that is yeah, my with, with dialysis because dialysis uh, there because their no, blood is cleansed no, every organ. No problem. Yeah, if, I agree uh, with you. Properly done and uh, yeah, because their blood is cleansed virtually every alternate day. Uh, yeah. uh, they they do very well. Only thing is we have to time that in between the dialysis and see the, if possible that the patient has a dialysis the next right. day itself. Right, sir. In the second scenario where you said the patient has doesn't have end stage renal disease but has HbA one C of seven point five. Uh, they may have other risk factors for developing endophthalmitis. Yes. And another thing uh, I saw that uh, my, uh, with every precautions taken, uh, endogenous endophthalmitis may occur. May occur in cases with all precautions taken. Uh, <laughs> we yeah, that is. Yeah, <laughs> when, when we. Oh, yeah, uh, that with all precautions taken. Yes. Yeah, in those in any patient with cataract, we tell them that this is a perfectly safe procedure. But just like we undertake an you know a train journey or a flight, the untoward incidents happen, and the frequency of such a thing happening in your case is also akin to the risk of you know having an air crash or a hijack. So I would like to answer that particular question. Uh, when we are not able to pinpoint the cause of uh, the infection. So we have taken all precautions. Uh, the uh, patient factors are absolutely normal. The patient is clean. The surgery has been clean. Everything has been fine, but end of the rheumatism occurs. There is one factor which I have been emphasizing in all my talks in the last 10-12 uh, years, and which is a very popular presentation actually, uh, called OT etiquette. So any breach in the OT protocol by any member of the surgical team. It could be surgeon, it could be uh, 
fellow, it could be sister, it could be OT boy, it could be the CSST staff, any of these causing a breach in the protocol, which has to be fo followed strictly, can result in end of thermitis in these patients. So I have some videos. Uh, I, I don't know whether we have time for that, but we, maybe at the end of the presentations, if we have time, I'll show those videos where uh, small breaches in the OT protocol can result in the isolated case of end of thermitis that you're talking about, not the cluster end of thermitis. Yeah, if time permits, we can run that video. It's a very, very educative video and clearly pinpoints as to, you know, it is not no longer an enigma as to how end of thermitis could have happened in that particular case because there are so many points along the route where there could have been a breach and it would not have come to the notice of the surgeon or even the nurse there. That's an excellent video, Dr. Professor Ashok Sharma. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, Dr. K. S. Kumar was one of the brilliant students when he was in PGI and he continued the same. I have two comments to make. One is that uh, uh, our institute's uh, head, Professor Amod Gupta, was the first to, uh, I think, describe metastatic endophthalmitis because of the contaminated IV fluids. And that is, uh, I think, the most important work. And in our regions, I, and I believe in all over India, the general practitioners, whenever the patient has fever, they give the IV fluids. And the patient demands it. And the contaminated uh, IV fluids, they cause fungal endophthalmitis. The second thing uh, uh, Professor has told that uh, breach in the continuity of uh, the like uh, uh, sterile chain is an important thing. I think that is the most important thing because the infection occurs from that place only. And I would advise all like, uh, uh, I think the practitioners like me, because I left PJ in 2002, uh, those who are in practice, I advise them to keep their staff happy. We have one incidence in our area where the surgeon's uh, key person was unhappy because of X, Y, Z reason. And this fellow did not like uh, did his job properly. And he had cluster of six end of thalmitis because of that. So please take care of your staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for those very relevant points. Because these things uh, may not even strike us because there might be a disgruntled uh, employee who wants, who is trying to get back at you. and. Uh, you pay very heavily for this with your reputation and uh, everything gone for a six. That's a very relevant point which we may not dis uh, discuss in the main frame of our presentations. Uh, intravi intravenous fluids, I think that particular paper came out even when, when I was there, I think. Uh, that is a very important cause of uh, endogenous endophthalmitis, particularly in predisposed individuals. And the other point which uh, I was, I, we, we didn't emphasize enough, which I thought now I should emphasize is, you must take a closer look at that uh, kit which uh, Dr. Apurva was showing and we must be using a disposable 1cc tuberculin syringe for preparing the injections. We cannot use the insulin syringe, we cannot use a 2cc syringe and try to mentally calculate the two smith. We will make it half of what we do in the 1cc syringe. So these are very very important points and using a 30 gauge needle and if you have access to a smaller needle than that, that is also important. Mixing the two in the same, particularly if you are using vancomycin and septazidim, is not advisable because it tends to crystallize a precipitate, although studies have shown that the precipitate is not less efficacious than when the injections are given separately. But then the problem is the 30 gauge needle may get clogged and, the, and it may, that precipitate may cause disturbing floaters to the patient, etc. So it's better we inject uh, in two different syringes. What we normally do is we try to uh, put the needle on to this uh, hub of the need uh, hub of the syringe a little lightly and then once we have given one injection we unlock and then take the other one put it onto the same needle and then inject so that there are no two points in which entry has been made so these are some finer points but intravitreal injections should be the norm every general ophthalmologist should be giving it without any fear at all with the t taking the steps that we just discussed. If there are any other points from the faculty, any other, uh, uh, um, yeah, please. So, uh, 
sir brought out the point about dialysis usually anemia of chronic disease the kidney is not producing enough erythropoietin and hence the patients have severe anemia and that is a risk factor for any infection because immunosuppression happens in leukemia anemia Uh, uh, also anemia, not just leukemia. So in such cases, that becomes a high risk patient for endophthalmitis. And one more thing, yeah. exactly. So I was going to say that. So there is a false low HbA1c. He was saying seven, seven point five. They get endof. Probably these patients are anemic to begin with. So the hemoglobin itself is less. Yes. Forget the glycosylated hemoglobin is obviously going to be less. So the there is a false low HbA1c, HbA1C. in That's patients very... with severe anemia. so that can be the reason why these patients are also high risk for infection sir does that answer your point sir because hba1c is based on the red blood cell mass actually uh, uh, what uh, i followed in the dialysis patients uh, everybody was taking erythropoietin also supplementation because it is usually given uh, three weekly or one monthly manner so they are receiving erythropoietin outside from outside source Also, along with that, and uh, it is unlikely that age uh, one C will be false because it is uh, from uh, very reputed center. So we take. Yeah. Sometimes we cross check also. But but that would be a logical explanation uh, for patients be. where that could. Yeah, but I do agree with your facts, sir. I now invite Dr. Mahesh to please deliver his talk, and if time permits, we will quickly go through that video. Even we may skip some small steps in between, but we will try and see the video of Dr. Guru Prasad. Good morning, friends. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. K. S. Kumar, Guru Prasad Sir, for allowing me to present. Uh, avoiding endophthalmitis, probably we have discussed how to avoid. I am talking about only legal point. Uh, I got interested in this topic because I did a course, uh, postgraduate diploma in medical law and ethics from New Orleans uh, during the COVID time, and uh, it's a very, uh, very nice course that all of us should uh, consider doing. so let me start with the liabilities of a medical practitioner actually we are liable in a civil case patient can sue us criminally patient can uh, go to the consumer protection patient can have a medical council complaint patient can go to, uh, to the human rights commission and we are liable in all this manner so i am not scaring but uh, these are the facts and uh, many times uh, this will be there and uh, medical negligence Uh, indian medical there was a case called indian medical association versus vp shanta in 1995 and uh, which ultimately put the noose around our neck uh, saying that we are liable for the damages uh, in a consumer protection act so if, when we really call uh, a case as a medical negligence there should be a duty between you and patient by a contract when the patient comes to you there is a contract then there is a breach of duty resulting in harm if i put a dilating drops and patient gets allergy most probably they won't uh, sue because it is not going to do any harm for permanently so this is uh, the the gist of medical negligence and uh, mind you criminal procedures are not usually taken against doctors but still we see lot of cases are being uh, charged on uh, 304a 304b so this is basically because of the nexus of politicians and uh, uh, police people uh, just to create and media you can say so they do all these things otherwise uh, uh, criminal proceedings should not be taken against a, a, a doctor unless there is mens rea that means doctor purposefully with a guilty mind try to kill or do harm to the patient so it has to be proven so otherwise criminal proceedings should not be and none of this will stand in court usually even though the initial media hangama will be there the basically every medical legal case is due to bad consent in uk there is what is called valid and real consent they mention only the details of the surgery and some major complications in us it is informed consent where everything is covered Uh, regarding the nature of the treatment outcome success risk alternative and risk with associated with no treatment and in india after the samira kohli and prabha manchanda case in 90, 2008 
Supreme Court has given clear guidelines on what, how a consent should be and it should be a true and legitimate consent. So that is what. In fact, there is a study uh, from South Korea, medical litigation associated with cataract surgery and 50% was due to bad consent. Okay. And India, it is valid consent given by the person, written and uh, actually before procedure, not after the procedure with two uh, witnesses freely, voluntarily given by the patient, signed by the doctor. Most of us don't even sign. When you have a complication, let it be endophthalmitis. We are talking about endophthalmitis. We, uh, usually the court applies what is called Bolam's test. This was a, a case 1957 and uh, 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 this is the uh, test to confirm the standard of care. What is Bolam's test? Whether you are doing the treatment suggested by an expert group of people. For us, what are the, who are expert people? Like a medical body or a guidelines are there, no? That uh, standard of care, I, you know, all India Ophthalmic Society guidelines or some textbooks are there. That is the standard of care. Or even expert witness tell what is the standard of care. So, Bolam test is applied by the court in your case and they will find you whether you are negligent. So, we should strictly follow the standard of care immediately give intravital injection as Dr. Kumar said, immediately refer the patient if it is out of our hands. I will show you the cases. Bolam's test is applied in plenty of cases in India. Like this case, somebody gave uh, UTA for UTA, they gave uh, amikacin had a problem. But uh, the court uh, did not say anything because in that case, that was the only sensitive drug. Unfortunately, there was a renal failure, which is a non-complication, which is not a negligence. So, this test is applied. But on the other hand, uh, uh, if you do something that is not accepted by a group of uh, experts, like this case, uh, patient had a uh, fracture which was reduced without general anesthesia and patient went into shock and died. The expert said uh, this was wrong procedure. So, in any case of endophthalmitis where you are facing a uh, medical legal litigation, some ex expert witness will be called and they will check whether what you have done is wrong or not. So, this is how they apply Bolam's test. Later, the shift was towards the patient side. Doctors were started uh, in, uh, discriminate. Uh, so, uh, uh, Bolito test started in 1990s and uh, 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 they, the court will decide. Not only if, if the experts say that, okay, he has not done this or he has done everything possible. Court may not take it uh, for granted. They will assess it again and find it whether it was logical. So, the news around the doctors tightens further. So, this is Bolito test. There is one more that I am not discussing, which is more scary. Lot of cases are there. Like this case was Malay Kumar Ganguly versus Sukumar Mukherjee. Actually, uh, there was a toxic epidemic necrolysis patient was given steroids. And the expert said, this is a standard treatment. But court found out with a lot of consultation that the, the uh, beginning and ending of the steroid was not proper. So, it was court decided against the medical board uh, opinion. So, some examples are there. Uh, I will tell you one example. Many of the uh, 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 endophthalmitis cases, the doctor after uh, doing surgery will see after one week. So, suppose uh, the next day or after two days, they get an endophthalmitis and doctor has not seen the patient. There is a negligence. Nowadays, these freelancing cataract surgeons are there who goes to one place, do surgery and then somebody else will see or may not see after one week, they see. So, expert says you have to see next day or you have to see when there is a problem. This is what... Uh, I told, if you are not doing the standard of procedure, you will not. Uh, yeah. Then uh, another thing is, this is another important thing, bad outcome of a disease is not the fault of the doctor. That is another thing. You do in good intention, cataract surgery, you do everything properly. Unfortunately, due to different uh, uh, reasons, they may get an end of time. Do the treatment properly, don't worry. So, you are not liable for bad outcomes. I am not discussing, uh, we need hours together for discussion. Now, another scary thing I will tell you, the compensation is calculated based on, uh, 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 it is not straight jacket formula initially. So, what the highest compensation is for the youngest patient, that is ROP. Till now, in ophthalmology, highest compensation awarded was nearly 2 crores for ROP because they will calculate this boy is the son of doctor couple. So, he would have studied this much, he would have earned this much in 50 years. And for that, he was not able to do because of the problem. And they will calculate 2 crores, 3 crores like that they will calculate. Uh, uh, since we are talking about endophthalmitis, usually it will be 50s and 60s, 70s patients. 
So this much amount will not be there. So there are so many things that has come out uh, after that CPA Act, Consumer Protection Act 2019. Uh, why a lot of people are getting consumer protection uh, cases? Because it is very easy. You just write in a piece of paper and give it in the consumer protection. I have complained against this. They will take so motto. They will take uh, uh, notice. They will send notice. It is very easy. But nobody gives civil case against a doctor. Why? Suppose I give a civil case against doctor and ask for 10 lakhs. I have to deposit 1 lakh in the court. And if I lose the case, that money is gone. So that is why civil case nobody goes. Civil case. But usually if you go for a civil case, you will win. Patient will win. Ultimately, because of some loophole, it is no. But nobody goes because of this. Consumer uh, CPA, consumer protection uh, codes, very easy. You just need a plain paper, write and give, or even email. And and after the 2019 CPA, the the amount ceiling is 50 lakhs in district forum. They can ask 50 lakhs and 12 crores in national forum. Okay, so that is the amount. Initially, it was much less. We get uh, more screwed after this 2019 CPA. And uh, I operate a Banga or a Bihari manual laborer. He can give the case in Bihar. So that is also possible now. So a lot of things are happening. And this we should be. Uh, so I did a literature search. Uh, like PubMed search. There is a literature search. India Canon is a site. And I took a lot of endophthalmitis and medical legal were the uh, keywords used. And I, Supreme Court and High Court verdicts or National Consumer Forum verdicts I took. I got 45 cases. Actually, I started preparing. Then after 5-6 cases, I got, uh, I will show you some cases like this. This was uh, 2012, Arvind Hospital versus Tangamma. Okay, this was a CAM case. CAM case, uh, they unfortunately went into end of thalmitis and lost die. Uh, the, the, uh, Litigation was, in, even in CAM case, the, the verdict was that even in CAM cases, the hospital is liable for compensation. Why? Because it is not completely free. I am doing a CAM and then doing 50 patients free, 50 patients charged, it is not considered free. So if it is complete free, no registration fee, even, that is why even in government hospitals, CPA, Consumer Protection Act is applied. Because there is an OP ticket for 1 rupee or 2 rupees. So, you only thing in government hospital, the, the uh, superintendent or the unit chief and then the doctor. It is like that, the, the hierarchy. So, they will charge against and government also. Uh, so, like that. Uh, so, even government hospital is liable for Consumer Protection Act. So, this is the outcome. And uh, they did nicely uh, all the documentation. And the, uh, uh, actually, unfortunately, the witness doctor said... Uh, uh, the patient had 6 by 18 and uh, you should have a good expert witness also. That is also important. Uh, 6 by 18, a cataract surgery was not needed at that time or something the expert witness said. And uh, the, they lost the case actually. The, it was uh, 10, 10 lakhs was uh, given. Anyway, so CAMP is not excluded in Consumer Protection Act. Then this is another, yeah, this is that uh, Avastin end of thalamitis. All of you might be remembering, no? Avast in end of thalamitis in Nagri. So here it was extremely well uh, defended by uh, doctors and others. IMA, VRSA, everyone contributed. Uh, in fact, the, it was a public interest litigation. There are some, I can't use some words, that is why I am, uh, people who, who give public interest litigations uh, to the court. They can take so much of cases against the doctors. So uh, in fact, uh, the Gujarat High Court uh, uh, dismiss the case saying that the person who uh, gave the PAL was not a victim. Anyway, uh, ultimately, a lot of hard work went inside and uh, uh, the VRSA, IMA, I mean, AOS, everyone uh, gave tons of literature and uh, they, the court decided that there are, uh, uh, Avastin can be used because it is recommended by ICO and even European Union, everything, and the cost is an important factor. So after this verdict only, uh, the, the rever ban re was reversed. Uh, what I want to tell is, here they manage the complications very well, and all, of, all the patients, I think, got uh, good vision after that. So this is uh, another this thing. So advisors withdraw the alert notice at that time. This is another case where, this is from Kerala only, uh, in fact, uh, uh, patient was refer, uh, had pain three days. The doctor uh, did not see properly. 
the and it was delayed by three days and that was the point of uh, uh, the, at the end the court made uh, giving a compensation for four lakhs all other management four days later they were referred to us then we did uh, treatment and then patient was sent to sn and then uh, they also said whatever we have done is complete so all expert witness but there was a gap of three days before referral of the patient and uh, the original doctor did not have vitrectomy facilities so there was that delay was considered and they were uh, the forum gave four lakhs for the victim so this is another one and then uh, uh, this is another case darshan lal arora was uh, in fact in this case uh, the expert witness from guru nanak uh, in delhi they considered uh, uh, all the management was fine and uh, the volam test was applied so it was dismissed actually there is another case where patient's hygiene was a problem, uh, uh, they very bad hygiene, but the court said you have not recorded, patient was an alcoholic also, you have not recorded in the this thing. So now you are telling he was alcoholic and his hygiene was bad and his, you can't. So that is the importance of having a proper records. Uh, initially itself you know document all this, alcoholic, all these things, then you can defend because of his problem that we got that. Then, uh, this is another one, uh, out of court settlement. Ideally, you should not go for out of court settlement as much as possible because there are a lot of things. The documentation is, may not be perfect many times. In this case, uh, the out of court settlement was overruled by the court. So these are few cases. I don't want to uh, stretch the things, but it is a, it's a big uh, topic. I just want to highlight few points uh, how to deal when you have a medical legal problem in an end of talmite. We are already judges of our own rights. Now, what is remaining is to become lawyers so as to defend it. Thanks. Thanks, Mahesh. Uh, after listening to your presentation, I wonder whether you did a short course as an understudy to some lawyer also. You have really fished out. Oh, he has done law. That's, that's news to me. Uh, it's very important to note the following with rela in relation to his talk. Uh, as far in the eyes of the law, what was not documented was not done. Exactly. So you must document every single thing, post-operative photographs, that you inform the patient and take signatures from the patient's attendants from time to time. In many of the corporate hospitals, every eight hours they call the attendants and sign, you, you know, your costs have gone up to this level. You, we have kept the patient informed of the auto meter like thing, uh, which Kumar, is happening. A couple of so, points. Actually, I had a survey. I uh, done a survey. Actually, in, uh, I took uh, who signs in the consent form, and uh, uh, only 70, 75 percent doctor sign. You are all doing surgery, but some junior doctor or some sister may be signing the consent form. Many of the doctors have not even seen the consent form. That is one. Number two is uh, electronic medical records. Yeah. Uh, electronic medical records you cannot tamper uh, after that day that is after 12 pm uh, midnight you can't if you make any alteration forensic evaluation of electronic medical records can find out you have tampered unlike a paper file paper file if it has not gone outside the hospital whatever you want you can write that is different but electronic medical records be very careful you cannot tamper with the electronic medical records it can be easily found out in a forensic examination the other important thing which uh, I have seen happening is particularly when there are multiple cases in a day, uh, many times the patient is taken to the operating room and in, in between one patient, they, their signatures might not have been taken. And then the surgery is done and then post-operatively signatures are affixed. And if that particular patient happens to have a problem, then you are in soup. So missing the consent, there's no way, there is no way that the patient can be wheeled into the operating room with the consent missed and keeping the attendants informed regularly and documenting that you have informed that should also be there and with relation to the high risk eyes this thought just occurred to me as i was sitting there asthma i have noted that asthmatic patients also are at high risk because they keep taking inhalers and the flora in their oropharynx is a little different from the normal flora streptococci are thought to be more involved so in asthmatics particularly i take particular care to do a pre-operative throat gargle with betadine for whatever value it's worth it so asthmatics fall into the high risk group 
there is still time for us so may i request dr guru prasad to please show his video which which tries to explain or which will highlight how we may miss that breach in the aseptic chain uh, just a point about uh, high risk uh, situation is um as a resurgery we as vitorectal surgeons do a lot of resurgery and one thing i tell my patients when it needs a resurgery is you have to take a head bath you have to comb your hair you have to have a haircut you have to shave well you have to scrub your face well because these patients who especially are from the rural people the rural uh, set, setting will not be so hygienic they will be shy to touch their eye even the, the amount of grease they have on their lids when they come for a follow up especially after one month you see they would not have touched the eye and that can be a sinus of infection so this is a secondary surgery is another high risk <laughs> for endophthalmitis so th thank you for the small uh, uh, opportunity of a big opportunity in fact of uh, presenting my other So this was uh, another uh, IC which we presented three days ago and uh, I hope the audience is different here. Uh, so operation theater etiquette is something that we should follow in order to prevent endophthalmitis and uh, we know about the cluster endophthalmitis, uh, the cause of which is uh, the CSST factors and the fluids etc. The in uh, intraocular fluids that we use where versus the solitary endophthalmitis that we get because of patient factors which uh, the previous speakers have alluded to the surgical factors and the most important which I will be presenting now is the breach of protocol. So the common mistakes in OT protocol let us see what it means and this presentation also probably explains that solitary case of endothermitis from a list of 5 to 10 cases of a, on a given day. So these are all the patient factors which have already been covered I don't want to repeat uh, hygiene of our poor patients superstitious beliefs of our rural patients. Yeah, coming to the point, here we have our resident who is uh, fresh and uh, has been asked to scrub and come in and assist. So he comes in, scrubs uh, as per instructions and he is asking for a stone towel and he is actually violating the air space of the trolley. So the drop of fluid is actually dripping onto the trolley which is just plain water from the overhead tank which has contaminated the trolley. So he has actually done damage by just scrubbing and not giving respect to the airspace of the trolley, which is a, a big mistake, I would say. So this is another uh, instance which, see, th these are all instances which I have noted and I have recorded and uh, recorded them on the mobile phone. And I want to share with you all that these are these small instances where uh, the uh, uh, solitary case of endophthalmitis can be explained in spite of clean surgery, in spite of a clean patient. So this is, if you suddenly ask the patients, uh, the attendant or the OT boy to get a pair of gloves for you, he will rush and come and he will be uh, not, you know, heading to the trolley space, the space around the trolley, he would have touched the trolley tip which will be eventually handled by the nurse and in the process cause contamination uh, to the entire uh, contents of the trolley. Uh, whereas the actual correct way of, correct way of uh, move movement in the OT is to keep away from the trolley, give respect to the trolley and uh, that is the way to go. So beware of surroundings while wearing a gown. Gowning is something that is extremely important. You should have sufficient space around you. See, this is uh, just to show this is actually me showing how the strings of the you know handcuff have been touching the uh, inst uh, equipment on the sides in the process getting you know contaminated and you are touching that with um, your bare hand which is of course washed but not sterile and in the process getting contaminated so these are some of the examples where uh, this is an example of how to wear the gown correctly have space around you and don't uh, ever touch anything around the, don't ever let the gown touch anywhere around the space where you are occupying to 
is to stand and change. So this is. So a short-term trainee is uh, they come very frequently to our hospital. Um, they uh, have not been actually taught how to wear gloves, and I got this this boy glove in hand. Yes, he had come for a short-term cataract training, and this is how he was wearing gloves. So, if you are not vigilant, if you are not watching how he has done it, how he has worn the glove, then his glove is totally contaminated, and he would have contaminated the entire operation theater environment just by not wearing the glove properly. So, the ideal way of gloving, I would like to show here. Of course, uh, we don't have students, I think, in this auditorium, in this uh, uh, hall, but so this is the way you should not even touch the glove with the bare hand. You can see that I'm holding it with the cloth, with the linen, not to touch the sterile outer surface. The glove is extremely important and to touch only the inner side, which is in contact with the skin is what you should follow. Gown removal is another thing where which uh, helps us in in um, reducing the scrubbing time between surgeries. Supposing you want to change your gown uh, between, th say, after three or four surgeries, that is the uh, uh, guideline of the AIOS as well. You can wear your gown for five surgeries, but wear different gloves for every surgery. So this is how the glove, uh, gown has to be removed because the inner surface of the gown, which is in contact with the skin, is still sterile and the way you uh, remove it inside out is extremely important and helpful in you in, in reducing the, uh, the, the scrubbing time which can be reduced even half just about two to three minutes of scrubbing is enough if you have removed the, the gown that way. Peeling of sterile pouches I think uh, I need not show this this is common but a, a, an assistant uh, a, a sister who is wearing a loose glove can do a mistake like this. This uh, both are doing mistakes here. The man opening the the pouch with a pen in hand and the sister wearing a loose glove, both can cause damage, which can be disastrous. In slow motion, you can see that actually the glove, loose glove, is touching the pen, and she has now contaminated the entire uh, OT trolley. So this is something that can happen. These are all things which actually happen. These are not imaginary, they happen and uh, they have been caught red handed and uh, told not to do it that way. They have been trained for that to overcome those um, wrongdoings. So this is another uh, example of example of violation of airspace of the trolley. The lady there wants to see the file because the surgeon will ask what are the details of the patient. But in the process, the pen has been dropped on the trolley. And if they are not honest, see, in the absence of the doctor, they may just pick up the pen and go away and uh, pre uh, pretend as though nothing has happened. But if they are not honest, you had it. The patient will develop endothermitis. So this is another example of how a solitary case of endothermitis can happen. Shaking the bottle is very, very important to look for impurities. I think we all know this. Ha, this is something that is extremely uh, common and important to know. You have to see that the, the IV set is properly pierced into the BSS bottle, into the, into the place where it is actually supposed to be pierced. If in the process, if, they, if some of these boys drink and come, they drink at night, they are, you know, some of them can be very indisciplined, they have tremors. In the process, if they touch everywhere else except at the at this at the cock, and then peers after touching everywhere else, then the entire basis bottle can get uh, contaminated. So this is something we have to keep a watch for. Keep training them. You know, inculcate a sense of discipline in all, all these staff members. Similarly, an ampule that has been cut irregularly, wrongly cut with a lot of glass pieces having gone in, causing contamination of the contents of the uh, ampule and the syringe the way the needle has to go in cleanly into the bore of the ampule is extremely important because otherwise if, if the needle touches 
If the needle touches the outer part of the ampule and then is passed inside, it is contaminating. The entire contents of the ampule are contaminated and therefore uh, this can cause endocelmitis. Painting and draping are needless to say very, very important. The novice uh, resident has to know these are all uh, presentations which uh, were meant for the resident, but I thought it was appropriate to tell all this again in an endothermitis session. So this is the actual correct draping procedure with all the lashes outside turned out so that none of the lashes will you know, actually uh, come into the field of surgery. And uh, one thing is that we uh, some, some of these busy surgeons will call from home to paint and drape the patient, if, especially if they are staying nearby. And this actually happens in uh, institutes. The, sir, the, the sister is waiting with the trolley ready, the patient is draped, the surgeon has not even come in, but the uh, surgeon is you know, not yet come, the resident is waiting, he's probably feeling hungry, he's just waiting patiently. And look at what happens to the trolley. The, 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 the nurses have gone out because they, have, they are fed up of waiting. And this patient who is operating, being uh, ready for a pterygium surgery, not blocked, not yet given, he is looking at his watch because he is impatient and wants to know how, how far he has been, how, how long he has been on the table. So this is something which has actually happened and we would definitely want that it should not happen again. So this is uh, another example of the surgeon suddenly coming in and the uh, nurse is getting suddenly alert and look at that. She's just squeezed in between the head of the patient and the trolley, uh, the, the back touching the head or head end of the, of the patient, which is extremely wrong. Anything below the waist is unsterile. Not even the gown is sterile, actually speaking. It's only the glove area, the wrist, up to the wrist is all that is sterile. Even the gown is not fully sterile. It is, yes, sterile, but not, not like the gloves. So this is, again, a source of contamination. Uh, use of cannulas which uh, are blocked should not be done because if the cannula is blocked, it is not sterile. An unclean or a blocked cannula cannot be sterilized. If among the all among all the processes that happen during during a, a CSSD process like cleaning, rinsing, drying, monitoring the uh, 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 set of instruments, disinfecting, and packing, the most important is probably cleaning. And if you cannot clean it, you cannot sterilize it. Please remember this. And never try to clean after sterilization. So this is something which I would like skip. The anesthetist uh, is usually a wasting anesthetist. We, many of us don't have in-house anesthetists and they're always on their WhatsApp. They, are, they induce the patient, they're always on the WhatsApp. Any, any, any uh, message that you have to convey to them, they're so engrossed in their WhatsApp, you have to send a WhatsApp message to, to say that you need something or to say the patient is getting blue or the patient is bleeding because of hypertension. And they don't wear masks. I'm sorry if there's any anesthetist here. <laughs> I'm sorry to offend, but that this is a fact. Uh, we have to enforce our rules on the visiting consultants as well. Borrowing sets, borrowing instruments from the uh, adjacent set is something wrong. And in a camp setting, there is poor personal hygiene, like I already said. There's overloading of the autoclave bins. There's high-speed surgery going on and there is reuse of instruments and there is this MDCS which I just mentioned, minimal duration cataract surgery which I hate. It is, you have to do surgery at a safe speed and not something like this in what happens in a bakery. So this is uh, done so rapidly, definitely not appropriate for a hospital setting for the kind of work that we do in a hospital. They're all highly skilled, there's no doubt about that. They're all high, highly skilled but, uh, but, but then Definitely not appropriate for eye surgery. So no MDCS, please. No minimal duration cataract surgery. So as much discipline as a pilot landing a plane is what we should exercise. Um, I'll just show this landing because it's so fast 
and the safety margin is so less in a in landing of a plane we all travel by flight and we know how much the skill is required on the part of, on the part of the pilot to land a plane so this is the kind of discipline that we have to maintain in the operation theater as well so in summary um, checklist is very important you have to refer to all the uh, listed things in the checklist and uh, it's like the check the cockpit everything has to be checked the overall cleanliness has to be maintained standard protocols like i showed are to be maintained this is just half of the presentation which i usually do in other uh, situations i have another 2025 videos which show the, the common mistakes that we common which we normally do in our operation theater training of staff about etiquette is very important an ounce of prevention is equal to a pound of cure is the message that i want to give today thank you very much sir may i share one of my experiences i was the surgeon and my resident was sitting there the patient was getting ready i was looking at the other side suddenly i looked at him he was scrubbed and he scratched his nose with the gloves on yes sir i have seen my residents taking a bud from the trolley and putting it in the rear when they are scrubbed <laughs> so this uh, these are all things that happened i have videos of all this i thought i'll make it concise and show only few videos so this is this is something which we should with that it should come from inside it, it should come from their conscience that that culture has to be in, you know imbibed by them from their seniors so we, it's our responsibility yeah uh, thank you dr gurup sir the, your presentation was really the cherry on the cake if i might say so i thank all the members in the audience i thank aios and i thank my co instructors for this uh, presentation which we hope was uh, delivered in a manner that was useful to all of you thank you <laughs>